Joshua chapter number 24. We'll read just a couple of verses here. Or maybe maybe we'll read maybe a little, little more. We'll read down to our text verse. Just a couple of verses I want to focus on. But Joshua is getting toward the end of his life and the end of his ministry. Of course, you know Joshua was the leader of Israel at this point. He had been with Moses and was one of the 12 spies. The 12 spies that went to spy out Canaan. There's a song that I learned in the youth camp and then I've taught it to children in children's church and Bible schools and things through the years. Twelve men went to spy out Canaan. Ten were bad and two were good. And the song goes on and you do the little motions with it and everything. Well, Joshua and Caleb were the two good spies, the ones that came back with a good report. The other ten and the majority came back and said that the land is full of giants. We can't conquer it. We can't take it. We can't live there. We've got to move on. We've got to leave this place by time. Joshua and Caleb said, no, this is the land of promise. This is the land that God has given to us. And they said that the land is flowing with milk and honey, grapes and clusters long. And so Joshua and Caleb were those two good spies. And although the children of Israel went with the majority and did not enter the land of Canaan at that time, they later returned and under the leadership of Joshua, we're able to cross the Jordan River and go into Jericho. Of course, you know the story about marching around the walls of Jericho 13 times, seven days, on the seventh day, seven times, and the walls came tumbling down. Well, Joshua was their leader at this point, and he was their leader until his death here right at the end of chapter number 24. And so we see now Joshua is giving his farewell address to the children of Israel. He's given his charge here, the blessings of Israel, or the blessings of Israel, and his charge to them as he speaks to them in chapter 24. Look with me, if you will, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, father dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacar, and they served other gods. By the way, when it talks about the flood here, it's not talking about the flood of Noah. I used to read through this just casually, not thinking about what I was reading, and I thought it was talking about the gods that were back there in Noah's day, but it's referring to the flood of the Red Sea and their deliverance, and you'll see that in the context as we read on. So we're talking about those on the other side of the flood. It goes back all on back to Abraham, who was obviously much after Noah. So this flood here, and you'll see in the context as we read on, is talking about the Red Sea and the crossing of the Red Sea and the drowning of the Egyptian army. And so look in verse uh, 3. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. And I gave unto Esau, Mount Seir, to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. And I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward I brought you out. I brought your fathers out of Egypt. And you came unto the sea. And the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen under the Red Sea. When they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And you dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand that ye might possess their land. And I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore he blessed you still. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over Jordan and came unto Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Gergesites and the Hivites and the Zebusites. And I delivered them into your hand. I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities 
which ye built not, and ye dwelt in them, of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not, do ye eat. Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. So he's just finished telling them of all the blessings God has given them. Now He begins their, the charge to them. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in, the, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers that were on the other side of the flood, in whose land ye dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, He it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage and which did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. The Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land, Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for He is our God. Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God, and He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods. Then He will turn and do you hurt and consume you after He hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. Joshua said unto the people, Your witnesses against yourselves, that ye have chosen you the Lord to serve Him. And they said, We are witnesses. <clears throat> now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and His voice will we obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, Set them a statue and an ordinance in check. Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. And so we see here, the Bible gives us Joshua's farewell address. Now I want you to think about what it would be like if someone who had been a mentor to you, someone who had been a hero to you, and I think a good example of that is uh, Brother Andrew Shank and, and the way he looked up to Dr. Bobby Robertson, his pastor, who just passed away. That's a good example of that, and I know you've heard him call his name many times ever since this church has been in existence, ever since you've come here, however long that may have been, you know that that was a hero to Brother Shane. To me, I look highly up to Dr. Harold B. Seidler, who was my pastor when I was in Bible college, and one of my teachers in Bible college. Or my pastor who's with the Lord now, who pastored my current home church that I work out of, who pastored it from the time I joined until uh, he retired and shortly thereafter passed away, Dr. Ralph Taylor. Those are mentors, those are men of God that we look up to. And if it come the time that we knew it was going to be the last time we could hear from them, the last message we could hear from them, the last thing they had to say to us, how important would those words be to our ears? Maybe someone you poured your life into. Maybe someone you've given yourself to for many years and you've helped that person and you have, you have really done a lot to them. You've given of yourself to them. And you know it's your last time to speak to them. How well are you going to choose the words you're going to say, knowing that it's the last opportunity that you will have to speak to them. So what I want you to understand here is the importance of the words Joshua is speaking to the children of Israel. How important must these words be? How much and how important is it that the children of Israel heed to these words and pay attention and make note of what he has to say? Now as we look back, how important it is that we look at Joshua's farewell address. Now that it is part of Scripture, 
It's part of the Word of God. And we look at His farewell address that He gives. I want, I want to focus on a couple of verses here. Notice in verse number 14, he said, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. Now verse 15 is some, by most a very well-known passage of Scripture. I find it, the way it starts out seems a little odd. Joshua says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. Now how can it be evil to serve the Lord? Uh, I think this is mostly a, a hyperbole, uh, or so to speak, the word that he's given an exaggeration based on their attitudes. Because if they're not choosing to serve the Lord, why would they make such a choice? Why would they choose to not serve the Almighty God that delivered them out of Egypt? So he says, well, you might, it's almost like he's questioning them, do you think that's an evil thing to do? He's obviously exaggerating, but he's trying to get a point across to them. Why would you not serve God? Why would you not serve the one that delivered you out of Egypt and the one that's given this land that you did not toil and fight for, these vineyards that you did not plant? He said, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. And he told them to have a choice. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But then he tells them his choice. He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What is your choice, Joshua said? He's given them in his farewell address a choice that they must make. And with that thought in mind, I want to focus on uh, this choice that they had to make, how it relates to us as I bring a message entitled, Joshua's Farewell Address, The Choice That Must Be Made. The Choice That Must Be Made. Father, we thank you for this day and the blessings you've given us. Thank you for the privilege again to stand behind this sacred desk and preach your word. I pray that you'd have your perfect will tonight in every heart. Speak to our hearts from Joshua's farewell address. Speak to our hearts from this question, this charge that he gave, and this choice that must be made. Would you have your will in every heart and life here tonight? In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. The choice that must be made. This, this charge, this address, this question that was presented to the children of Israel, was, quite, was given to them several thousand years ago, about 3,000 years ago. That's been a long time ago. It wasn't given in our lifetime. It wasn't given in our generation. It wasn't given, the, given in our age. But one thing I want you to notice about this charge, about this question, and about this choice that must be made, number one, is that it is a choice for the present. It is a choice for the present. He questioned them, who, who are you going to serve? Or all these other gods, you've got some choices to make. Are you going to serve the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell? Or the gods on the other side of the flood? The gods of the Egyptians? Are you going to serve the gods of this pagan or that pagan? Or are you going to serve the true and living God that delivered you out of the land of Egypt and give you the land you dwell in? What is your choice? There's other gods that they can choose from. And so you might make the question today, in 2018, in the United States of America, and you say, well, we don't have a bunch of other gods around us that other people are worshiping. We don't have a bunch of other gods that we uh, tend to want to bow down to. We don't have this sort of choice. But wait a minute. What does the first commandment tell us? The first commandment said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The key there is that word before. Because anything we place in our lives before God becomes an idol to us. It becomes a God to us. By the way, notice there are two commandments there dealing with this in the Ten Commandments. After it says that thou shalt have no other gods before me, then it says commandment number two, that thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. So it doesn't have to be a little idol carved out of a stone or a piece of metal or a piece of wood sitting on a shelf or standing on a hillside. 
It doesn't have to be some graven image to be a false god. It can be, as the commandment number one tells us, anything that we place before God in our lives. Whatever we place before God in our life becomes an idol to us. It becomes a God to us. There are many things in our lives that there may not be anything wrong with in and of itself. There's nothing wrong with fishing. I love to fish. Uh, I just come out of the state of Minnesota the last couple of weeks. I knew I was going to be about a week and a half there. And the town that I was going to be parked in has a nice little river running right through the town. The last couple of years, the first year I went through there, I bought a 24-hour fishing license. And it's actually good for exactly 24 hours. So if you start fishing at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you can fish all the way up to 2 o'clock the next afternoon. So I bought it and and activated it in the afternoon and went fishing that afternoon, got up the next morning and went fishing the next morning. So it's almost like I got two days of, of fishing out of that one day 24 hour fishing license. Last year I went back and I went there and I bought a 24 hour fishing license and that didn't do me. I had to go back and I bought a, another day. I went and bought another 24 hour fishing license and did it again. Took some kids from a church over in South Dakota where I was at back over to Minnesota and did another day of fishing. This year I went back, it's going to be there a week and a half, and I thought, I ain't buying three or four 24 hour fishing licenses. I went ahead and bought the annual fishing license. <laughs> and with the exception of Sunday, uh, for that week and a half I was there, I fished, I believe, every day we were there, except for maybe the day we left. Or the day we got there and the day we left. I fished every, put on a fish fry for the interim pastor there at that church that I filled in for on that Sunday. Uh, when he got back in town, did a fish fry for his family. And I took half of the leftovers back with me and ate them another day. I fried some fish myself before we ever had the fish fry. And then I've got fresh fish in the freezer from it. I, got a, I love to fish. I, I love to eat fish. I love to catch fish. By the way, he caught a turtle and dressed it and ate it too. Oh, that's good. I caught three turtles. And by the time I caught the third one, I said, I'm keeping this one. And uh, so I, all that's beside the point. But what I'm saying is I enjoy the outdoors. I enjoy fishing. I enjoy hunting. I haven't really hunted in many years. I don't, just, I don't have time to put into that, but all that's involved, to get ready to go hunt and find somewhere you can hunt and all that. But I love to hunt. There's nothing wrong with playing ball. Nothing wrong with watching ball. Nothing wrong with sports. Athletics are good. They're healthy. They're healthy to be involved in. Nothing wrong with some of those things. Nothing wrong with having a bass boat if you can afford it. You still tithe and support missions and give to God like you all do. Nothing wrong with those things. But do you know any of these things can become a God to us? That's right. As soon as we place them before God. You see, there are folks that will, won't be in church on Sunday. I don't know about just lost folks. I'm talking about folks that are members of godly, Bible-believing churches. Every now and then, they don't show up on Sunday morning because they're on the lake or they're on the river. They're in the woods somewhere hunting. Or they're in a ball game or they're playing ball. And it, it grieves me to see some families, and I don't know the, the, what people do here throughout the year, but it grieves me to see them uh, you know, put their kids in everything, get their kids involved in so much they don't have time for the things of God. They don't have time for church. I had to make a choice shortly after my salvation. I got saved when I was 14 years old. Now, I've been raised in church, but I got saved when I was 14 years old. And I had an opportunity that year to go to a Christian school. It was a Christian school of another independent Baptist church down the road. And so in that Christian school, they, they wanted me on the basketball team, and it wasn't because of my athletic abilities. It was because you need five people on the court all the time. And you need a few people on the bench just in case. That's the only reason they wanted me. But they wanted me on the team. And I, I went out to play basketball, and turns out they had practice on Mondays and Wednesdays in the afternoon. And, and, and they said, oh, well, we get out in plenty of time to get home, get dressed, and get to church. Get to church. The only problem is I'd already gotten involved in the bus ministry at my, my home church where I grew up. We ran the, with the van routes on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And I had to be there about an hour and 15 minutes before church started to go out on the van route. And that basketball practice was set up just in time to get everybody time to go home, get a shower, and get to church. And like they were really going to all do that. Now, this was a Baptist church's school. And I told the coach, and I said, I can't make the Wednesday night practice. I've got obligations for my church. I have to be there. Right. Well, I remember one day that pastor of the school's church came to me, another independent Baptist church. He came to me and said, Van, he said, I, I talked to your pastor, and, 
He said, you don't have to be there on Wednesday nights. And I didn't say it to him, but I thought to myself, I said, I don't serve Brother Ronnie. I serve God. Amen. God hasn't given me peace to put that off and play basketball Amen. for the school. And I did tell him that, well, I feel like I need to be there. That's what, that's, you know, what the Lord wants me to do. I quit the basketball team. That Amen. time on, the Christian school, I was ostracized and, and considered having no school spirit because it left the bench short. You know, that there wasn't enough people sitting on the bench in case somebody had to come out and catch breath. You know, I didn't care. I had to make a choice. That's right. I had to make some other choices that year. In fact, uh, during that Christian school year was when I obtained my life verse, Romans 8, 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. There's a lot of folks that put things before God in their lives. Simple things. Things that there's nothing wrong with. But once it takes the place of something God wants you doing, once it keeps you from church, keeps you from studying the Word of God, keeps you from praying when you ought to, keeps you from serving God when you ought to, keeps you from obeying God when you ought to, as Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. The Bible talks about those whose God is their belly. By the way, that's not just talking about food. When the Bible talks about gluttony, it's not specifically just talking about food. It's talking about feeding the flesh. The Bible uses that in an analytical or an analogy type of a way. That it's uh, saying that you feed your desires, you feed your flesh, whose God is your belly, pleasure. We live in an entertainment society. Yes, we do. The only way to build a big fancy church nowadays is to be entertained. And some people would say the goats. You're going to leave the sheep or you're going to entertain the goats. Uh -huh. And so, you see, their God is their belly because they're putting something before God. Their desires, their pleasures, anything we place before God in our lives. It can even be careers. It can be education. Yeah, it can right. be anything. Now, those things are important. They're important in their place. But when it takes the place of God or comes before God or becomes more important than God in your life, when it becomes more important than God's will in your life, that thing becomes a God to you. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Is it going to be the gods that your father served? Is it going to be the gods that your family serves? Is it going to be the God that your community serves? The God that your classmates serve? The God that the people in your neighborhood serve? Or is it going to be the true and almighty God that delivered you from your sin? Amen. And the God that gives you the breath that you breathe every day of your life, choose you this day whom you will serve. It is a choice for the present. It doesn't matter that these words were written 3,000 years ago. This is a choice that you must make today. It's a choice for the present. Not only is it a choice for the present, but I want you to see also that it is a choice with a price. Look at verse 14. Joshua said, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood in Egypt. And serve ye the Lord. That's a price of commitment. You must commit to God in truth and sincerity that you are going to give yourself over to God to serve Him. Choose you this day whom ye will serve. We have peer pressure. There are those around us that are going to try to pull us aside and make us make other choices, make us make wrong choices. And those people are going to put that peer pressure upon us. But it is a choice with a price. It is a price of commitment. There may be some things we have to give up when we serve God. I gave up some things. I gave up basketball. I gave up... I wasn't going to be able to be real on the court. I know that. <laughs> but I gave up uh, uh, the popularity of being an athlete in the school. And I gave that up because I wanted to serve God. And there's some things you must give up. And there may be a price that you have to pay. There's a difference between saying you'll do something mm -hmm. and doing it. Proverbs 28, verse 13, the Bible says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Mm -hmm. It's not just that we say with our mouths that we serve God, but are you really going to do it? Are you going to follow it through? I've seen a lot of people it gets me with the way folks will talk about oh pray for ain't so and so pray for my mama, pray for grandma I'm praying for you, you see them in town you tell them what's going on, oh I'm praying for you they're not serving God uh -huh. they don't give anything in their lives to God 
yet they say they pray. The Bible says, He that turneth his ear away from the law of the Lord, even his prayer shall be an abomination. If you don't give your time to God, and that's what folks do, they'll say with their mouths they're praying for you. They'll ask you with their mouths to pray for them like they're serving God, but they give nothing in their lives to God. Mm -hmm. They have no time in their lives for God. There's a difference between saying it and doing it. There's that peer pressure. It's a price with commitment. By the way, peer pressure kind of works both ways, too. There isn't such a thing as positive peer pressure. And to take that a step further, even it has a positive and a negative side to it. You know, there's a reason we need to surround ourselves with the people of God. There's a reason we need to make most of our entertainment involved around the church house and folks in the church and folks that are other Christians because that, that positive influence is going to help us. It's going to lead us in the right direction. But at the same time, I'm convinced that many people that I've seen in church that have been raised in church, have been in church for years, and they're there every Sunday. They're there no matter what. They're always there, but in their heart, they're just not serving God. I'm convinced that the only reason they're even sitting on a pew on Sunday morning is because of whose feelings they may hurt when they don't show up. Or because of what pressure they're going to get out of the preacher or their, their loved ones or their fellow church members if they don't show up. And so that positive peer pressure is the only reason they're even sitting on a pew. In their heart, they're as cold and not right with God as they can be. If you're going to choose to serve God, it's a choice with a price. A price of commitment. But not only is it a price that you'll pay when you choose to serve God, but there's also the price of chastisement, a price you're going to pay if you choose not to serve God. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 8, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Ananias and Sapphira learned a lot about that in the book of Acts, if you remember that story. Went out and sold a piece of their land and the Bible plainly says, you know, Peter, the apostle, said to him, was it not yours as long as you had it? Why are you going to lie to the Holy Spirit? I mean, it wasn't that they were, what were required to do that. The fact is, they came and lied about what they had done. And Ananias came in and lied and said, I sold this property to give it all to the Lord, making himself look spiritual. Mm -hmm. I've seen people do that. I, I'm not going to tell the illustration right now, but I had a personal situation where someone uh, made themselves look spiritual when in fact they were going off deep into sin and they made up a lie to make themselves look spiritual in doing so. You know, Sapphira came in, his wife, when she showed up, they said, did you actually sell the land for this amount that y'all are giving? She said, oh yes, we sold the land for this amount, we're giving it all to the Lord. The fact is they were just giving a small portion and keeping the rest. Not that there was anything wrong with that. They made clear there was nothing wrong with that. They said, well, wasn't it not yours to keep? But they're lying, saying they gave it all to God, making themselves out to look super spiritual when they were not. And they said, the same men that carried your husband out and buried him are ready to drag your body out and bury you. And that's exactly what they did. This is a choice with a price. If you don't choose to serve God, or you want to lie about it and serve with your mouth and not with your true service, there is a choice of chastisement, a choice that a price of chastisement, a price that must be paid. But then I want you to notice in verse number 23, verse number 23, the Bible says, Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. Here he's telling them that you need to put some things away from you. You need to cleanse yourself. You need to get some things out of your lives. I want you to see that this choice that must be made is not only a choice for the present. It is a choice with a price. But I want you to see that it is a choice for purity. A choice for purity. He said, put away the strange gods that are among you. There's some things we need to get out of our lives. Mm -hmm. There's some things we need to rid ourselves of. In fact, there may be some of those things that there wouldn't necessarily be anything wrong with. But because it is a weakness to us, it is a stumbling block to us, it is a weight to us in our Christian life, we need to get rid of them. We need to get those things out of our lives and purge ourselves of them. There's some things that are flat out sinful that we let lie around that we need to get out of our lives. It is a choice for purity. Joshua said, purify yourselves. Put away these strange gods. Get them away from you. Then he said, incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. Do you know what incline means? It means to 
go up. You know, uh, I learned that when I travel out in this part of the country, especially getting on up into South Dakota. I don't know what your elevation here is, but I know we're on the Missouri River and it goes right on up. The further you travel, the more you're going up. But I found out when I, li I live down in the southeast and we're about 600 feet above sea level down there. When you get up to Hoban, South Dakota, you're right close to 2,000 feet above sea level. And it's flat. Now back home, if you're 2,000 feet above sea level, you're on the mountain. And if, you, if you're 2,000 feet above sea level and, and you look out across the horizon, you're looking down the side of the mountain. But I found out when I got up there, as flat as it can be, I'm going uphill the whole way while I'm getting here. And I believe it takes a lot more fuel to get to South Dakota than it takes to get home from South Dakota. Why? Because there's an incline all the way. You may not notice it. You may not realize it until you're pulling 30,000 pounds. It looks like you're level, but you realize you got the pedal to the floor and you can't quite keep up the speed limit. Especially when you get to South Dakota, and I was shocked when I saw that speed limit, 80. Oh, oh my you know, you don't, you don't see that back home. That's real. Uh, but uh, there, on the way this away, there's an incline. It goes up. There's a hillside. And the Bible tells us here, Joshua said to the children of Israel, Incline your heart to God. If you're going to look to God, you're going to have to look up. Looking unto Jesus means looking up. Looking to higher things, looking to higher places. There's a song, can't think of exactly the words, but it talks about higher planes. Talking about looking up and inclining your heart toward God. Do you love the Lord? Do you want to have fellowship with Him? Are you giving yourself over to Him? The, the incline your heart unto Him. Look up to Him and seek fellowship with Him. Joshua said, incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. This is a choice for purity. Get the things out of your life that are getting in the way of serving God. Make the choice to serve Him. Choose to do the things that please God. Amen. And that's, that's this thing about living a separated Christian life. I, I hear people say all the time, you know, there's this movement got to go on among our churches just a few years ago. People said, well, it's not about the do's and the don'ts. Well, what is it about? Well, it's about, you know, just witnessing to others. Well, that's one of the do's. Well, it's about, you know, worshiping God. That's one of the do's. Well, it's about uh, uh, just coming to church and, and being faithful to God. That's one of the do's. I think what it is is they just don't like the don'ts. But the fact is, this book tells us the ways of God. And when it comes to the do's and the don'ts, the problem that we have is we just look at them like rules. And everybody wants to, you know, there's that old world they're saying, rules are made to be broken. No, they're not. That's not what rules are made for. That's the world's viewpoint. But when we look at it, it's just a bunch of rules. Bible. And we want to free ourselves from those rules. We take out of context this thing about liberty and this thing about being made free. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says that means you're free from sin. Yeah, that's right. Right. That means you're free from the bondage of sin. You're not in bondage anymore to sin, to do wrong, to live right. But you're, the Bible does say you're under bondage to live righteously before God. So what am I trying to say here? We need to purify ourselves, incline our heart toward God, and quit looking at it like a rule book, mm -hmm. but looking at it like a, put it in sports terms, a game play book. Look at it like a, like a uh, book with solutions to it mm -hmm. that tells us how to please our Lord. Mm -hmm. How to please our Savior. Mm -hmm. The one who died on the cross, paid for our sins redeemed us, saved us from an eternity in hell, gave us that abundant life here on this earth. Do you love Him? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John said, for this is the love of God, we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. So what do we need to do? We need to put our face in this book and incline our heart toward God and learn what it is we need to do to serve God. Why? Because it is a choice for purity. Joshua's farewell address 
is the choice that must be made. A choice for the present. A choice with a price. And a choice for purity. It's a choice that you must make today. It's a choice you must make every day of your life. By the way, Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And you may be, some, there's some young people in here right now. And right now, your parents may say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Listen to me, young people. This is a choice you've got to make. That's right. You've got to make that choice. Are you going to serve God? Are you going to live for God? You may be older here today. You may be in retirement already. It's still a choice that you must make. This is the choice that must be made. What is your choice to stay on?